Let's all right. Let's jump to. I mean, you you outline what what the strength of of the left is today is that there is more extra institutional power uh, than we've seen, you know, at least um, in uh, several decades. And with with noting that the power of unions has declined, but also with that understanding that there had also been some. I don't want to call it self-sabotage by the unions, but a um, a, de- a, a, a depowering of uh, of unions by becoming more transactional. So, but you you mentioned at the end there are three major challenges. Um, one is to harness this mass anger at the corruption of our political process. Um, two, to build the strength of unions, and three to develop a left infrastructure to fill the bureaucracy, which is, I think, a, an exceptional point, particularly when you look at the, the context of Bernie Sanders, who, you know, entered in that race uh, in 2016 without really any foreign policy people. And and we can see, you know, him building up a, a staff as just a, a metaphor on some level of, of saying, like, we need to build now that there's sort of like some ideological underpinnings uh, build people who who um, can implement these policies f- uh, from a yes. vaguely technocratic perspective. Yeah. So I mean, by by view, and I mean, is and this is the optimistic side is that there is a ton of political energy on the left, um, and indeed, there's a plethora of solutions to the cl- and kind of classic problems that the country faces from, you know, how to deal with prisons to how to deal with the financial sector to what kind of foreign policy the country should pursue. Um, but one of the real big problems is that the left basically is exclusively an extra institutional voice. And, you know, some of this is just about um, he, he, how politics emerged over the last few decades. Like if, so it's, so one thing that's obvious and we're seeing this in the context of the midterms is that, so you have a, a centrist leadership within the democratic party that absolutely, despite the persistent failure of its own policies, the history of defeat over the last decade, just like refuses to cede the stage and is continuing to like back centrist candidates and blue dog and pro business candidates. Right. But I think there's a deeper issue, which is if you are basically if you're between 35 and 75, and this is one of the reasons why like Sanders is kind of important as like an old person, or I should say as a person that's older. Um, if you're between those ages, that if you are politically ambitious, you know there are all of these cues about like what kinds of views would be necessary if you wanted to be like taken seriously. You had to have the same views as the people that were the grown-ups. Now, of course, it turned out like the grown-ups actually didn't have positions that were up to the challenges of the times. But what it did do is it contained and in fact eliminated, you know, generations of creative and imaginative political thinking. Right. And this is not just about candidates. It's it's about like, you know, the think tanks. Like right. what think tanks you'd go to, um, what organizations you'd join if you were in college, what types of fellowships were available to you if you wanted to get involved in foreign policy, like what kinds of jobs would be available to you if you wanted to be a legislative assistant to a, a senator or, an, or a congressman. The center-left media, I would argue, too. Abs- absolutely. And it's meant that now we're at a moment where you you know there's a reckoning even if it's not quite reached the party and it hasn't entirely reached the center left mainstream media but there's a reckoning with the implications of of these views and there's lots of young people um that have contesting positions but they need to have like the institutional space to be able to actually develop like well what would right. be po- policy what would be like the programmatic policy paper that goes with this like how would you inculcate um, those kinds of commitments and the way I sort of say it facetiously in the the pa- in the, the piece is like let's say Sanders wins you actually would have something like quote unquote like deep state um, a deep state response to a truly left president coming out of elements of the security state, the carceral state, and, and business, you know, not this kind of like right-wing fever dream. 
And you'd have to figure out, like, well, in that setting, like, well, who's the person that you'd have in a junior position in the National Security Agency, even if your whole goal in the National Security Agency would be to roll back some of the most, um, you know, deleterious effects of surveillance. Like, you actually have to have people that are knowledgeable enough to fill right. those positions. Right. You where can't is, just put where, in, yeah, you can't just put in, like, the, frankly, like, the kids that have been trained by the DNC. Right. Well, where is Bernie Sanders Center for American Progress is another way of putting it. Or where uh, is Bernie Sanders Heritage Foundation or Federalist Society? <laughs> those type of, uh, of, uh, of things. And, yeah. right, and, and so, um, I mean, but you're you, I mean, I think your piece is optimistic that ultimately um, the, the Democratic Party will if not be responsive, will be slowly, um, will evolve into uh, that vehicle for the left. Well, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd go quite that far. What I would say is that my piece, one of the things I see my piece as is a warning against both nostalgia and, and something that's oftentimes connected to like political despair. And by nostalgia, I mean, don't fall into the trap that you see how, I mean, truly craven and terrible Trump and the people around Trump are and the Republican Party more generally. And, um, you know, presume that what we had before was better, um, either in the form of Obama or even like, you know, the, the recuperation of Bush Jr. before Obama. That, you know, actually the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, the kinds of policies that we associate with um, the Cold War agreement generated real, real social problems and real violence and, and pain. So we should not we should not look back glowingly on that period, and we should also not be despairing about the present because the truth of the matter is is that since Trump wasn't inevitable, you could tell the story of the present as the revival of a left politics that we haven't seen really in decades. When I was growing up, forget about calling yourself a socialist. No politician in the Democratic Party, or very few, would be willing to call themselves liberal. Yep. Now we're at a moment in which the basic questions about, you know, the structural features of white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism are actually being contested. Now that doesn't mean that the left is going to win or build a kind of cross-racial, class-conscious coalition um, that I'd like to see emerge, but it does mean that we're at a moment of what amounts to real political struggle over like the central terms and that that can actually generate um, transformative change for for the better um, it also means to me that we got to be really wary about misreading um, if there is a wave election in 2018 that you know it's very possible because of just how incomp incompetent and you know to use yet another adjective like grotesque Trump and the people around Trump are that, you know, the centrists in both parties might be back in charge. And the way to read that is, well, okay, we've kind of put, you know, we've put Humpty Dumpty back together. Um, this was all an aberration. Uh, we can go back to sort of the sureties of what we assumed, quote unquote, America was about. And, you know, my view is that if that ends up being the lesson, we're going to see the same cycles play out again. It might right. work for might work in 2020, it might work in 2022, but the basic problem is those centrist perspectives are not up to the challenges that are perennial challenges in the US, and they're gonna just necessarily produce their own instability and breakdowns, and then we're gonna be faced with the same set of problems again. Aziz Rana, the piece is Goodbye Cold War. We will link to it uh, over at N Plus uh, One magazine at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. All right, folks. We're going to take a uh, quick break, head into the fun half of the program, uh, wherein we will take your phone calls, we will take your IMs, we will play some audio of horrible human beings and some one one or two nice people. Got some good ones, actually. We've got some good ones two, today. Two heroes. Two heroes. No goats. Um, you know, it was nice. I mean, this is apropos maybe a little bit of what we've just heard. A little bit. 
Teamsters, um, we, we've talked quite a bit about how ICE has uh, been unshackled, and we're now starting to see uh, some pieces in the mainstream media about it. Uh, Washington Post had a piece that the agency made 30, over 37,000 non-criminal arrests in the government's 2017 fiscal year. That's more than twice the number of the previous year. Um, those facing deportation who show up for periodic check-ins with ICE to appeal for more time in the United States can no longer be confident that good behavior will spare them from detention. Uh, the... The good news, I don't know if it's good news, but it's not, it's somewhat positive. Um, two things. One, a federal court in uh, California ruled the other day that the L.A. County Sheriff's Department violated the constitutional rights of thousands of inmates that the agency detained for federal immigration authorities without probable cause. So basically, I guess the process works and maybe... Uh, Ronald Reagan will tell us, though, the uh, ICE issues detainers, which are requests to hold inmates for up to 48 hours so that ICE can take those individuals into custody. But these are not warrants. These are not court orders. So the court found that they amounted to new arrest under the Fourth Amendment without any probable cause. No judge has looked at these detainers. It's just ICE issuing a request. So the department's policy is now defunct. Which means that um, L.A. County will not be functioning as a, an illicit branch of ICE, essentially. And also positive, New York State Teamsters are getting prepped to become a sanctuary union. So in 27 shops, business agents, supervisors, and frontline workers are getting uh, schooled on their rights under U.S. law and when and how to challenge federal immigration agents who show up at their work sites. That's pretty good. Hell yeah. So uh, good for the Teamsters. There's that left internationalism. There you go.